Today we're going to talk a little bit about uh, motivational interviewing. Uh, normally we do one and two day sort of uh, two day classes. We're going to try to compress it into 90 minutes and see how we do with that. Um, at, uh, at UCLA we have a motivational interviewing academy where we um, evaluate individual tapes uh, using the MITEI and um, evaluate different aspects or components of an individual um, using various components of uh, motivational interviewing. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and, uh, and just get started because we have a lot of material to cover today and uh, not a lot of time to do it in. So I have no commercial interests uh, at, at this point in time. And, um, but I do want to say that in terms of our agenda, we're going to cover sort of what helping styles are, um, how to identify some helping styles, talk a little bit about motivation, how we might, what we think about it, how we might enhance motivation, talk about the motivational interviewing, the principles, the style motivational interviewing, um, and the micro skills that really go into uh, making up what is referred to as motivational interviewing. And we'll if, uh, if we can get our equipment to work, uh, and it looks like we can, we'll get to see um, Dr. Bill Miller you know, at work utilizing some motivational interviewing techniques. And by the way, there's, there's a lot of material online, um, videos online uh, with Terry Moyers as well as uh, Dr. Bill Miller um, utilizing MI techniques. I, my recommendation is you go online and, and uh, familiarize yourself with, with some of those techniques. It's, uh, it's, it's helpful from a clinical perspective, just sort of to gauge where you are in, in relation to that. Additionally, there are some materials online. Um, if you go to the uh, Clinical Trials Network, um, the CTN Dissemination Library, there is a practice module where you can practice your own techniques, your own motivational interviewing skills, and get rated uh, in, in doing so. So that's uh, ctndissemination.org. So ctndissemination.org. And it's the CTN Dissemination Library. CTN is the National Institute on Drug Abuse Clinical Trials Network. Um, and it's, it, there's all the materials available online there are free of cost. It's, uh, it's a great resource for uh, uh, providers, administrators, as well as uh, clinicians. There's a, a, a variety of research. I think they've, in the 16 years that the Clinical Trials Network has been in place, they've completed somewhere in the neighborhood of 60 um, uh, clinical trials, both evaluating uh, medication as well as behavioral therapies uh, for substance use disorders. And these interventions or the trials have been implemented in programs like yours throughout the nation. There's about 200 programs, uh, treatment programs, that are affiliated with 13 universities across the nation. Um, the Clinical Trials Network was uh, developed by Alan Lesher. For those of you who attend uh, Dr. Barthwell's um, presentation, she talked about uh, Dr. Ellen Leshner, who was then um, the director of the National Institute on, uh, on Drug Abuse, and he developed the Clinical Trials Network, and it's still going today. So let me ask you guys, <clears throat> what's motivation mean to you? How do you know it's in the room? How do you know somebody's got it? I got 90 minutes, so I, you know, yeah. Personal energy, the way you react in front of a client, the way you carry yourself. Okay. Uh, facial expressions are good in that, maybe hand gestures. And it could be, and then you move to the linguistic side. Right. And intonation uh, is in there, and then how are you phrase whatever you're saying. Abs absolutely. And it works both ways. It, it, it works both ways. So what you... What I heard you describe was that there's a, a sort of a physical presence. 
as well, sort of paying attention, the eye contact. Um, but additionally, there's sort of the, the conversation, the discussion that goes along, you know, um, whereby you might be able to recognize whether somebody's engaged or whether they're not. You know, I mean, if you go home to your spouse and they're sitting there watching television and you come in and you want to talk about the day and they keep watching television, you kind of get the idea that maybe they're not engaged or don't have a lot of motivation in terms of, I'm speaking of myself, of course, um, to engage in the, in, you know, in the process. What else? How, how else would you describe motivation? How do you know it's in the room? How do you know it's good? If there is such a thing as a good or bad motivation, how do you know it exists? Curiosity and questioning. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Pardon me? Lessening of resistance. Can you, can you tell me a little bit more about that? Well, um, less to be offended and, and perhaps examining um, self-examination, being open to new ideas. Um, okay. Absolutely. Yes, thank you. Uh, receptiveness. Yeah, being open to new ideas. Absolutely. Yes, sir. Okay, all right, so the presence being there and maybe participating in the interaction, talking about, sharing in the discussion, maybe putting forth of, of, of yourself in, in terms of maybe your own ideas or um, notions about what might help your current condition and help you to move forward in terms of the recovery process. Okay. Yes? I would say motivation is a complex concept involving uh, neurophysiological states, which in turn direct behavior, which is used to infer the nature of motivation. I love that. And, and I wish you would write that down for me, because then I might, might be able to pass that on. Thank you. Yes? <laughs> Maybe I could simplify it and just say, get somebody to do something. Get somebody to do something, okay? All right. So get somebody. So really, you're you're talking about getting somebody to do something to change a behavior, okay? And that, in 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 somewhat sense, is really what we're trying to do is to help move our patients or our clients, however you want to phrase it, um, move them from point A to point B, but without our doing the work. Because one of the things that we do know about motivational interviewing is there's a protective factor that helps us to stay in the field. It reduces burnout for clinicians, which is critically important. It puts the onus of the effort on the clients right where it should be. It's ultimately their recovery. It's their life. And so that's, that's sort of the position that motivational interviewing takes. And, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. So what we're going to try to do is, is to try to figure out sort of how people change, exactly what you said, how to, how to make, help people make changes. There's a number of different styles. There's, there's the directive style or following style, a guiding style for that matter. So directing, you know, if, if uh, I, I think we've all done some directing in, in, in our days. It's like, look, don't you know this is bad for you? Don't you know this is going to kill you? This is what you got to do, okay? And you need to do it now. Now, you know, we can, we can do that. We could probably see, I don't know, 40 patients in a day if we, uh, if we used a directing style like that, all right? Now, whether or not they would come back is a whole different thing. And whether or not they would actually incorporate those recommendations into their daily activity is a whole, is, is a whole nother topic of, of conversation. But we know individuals who direct, and this really isn't what motivational interviewing is. And it's not a following style either. You know, we're not, we're not just going to sit around and ask somebody how they feel, you know, about having lost their children. Though that might not be a bad starting place in some instances to get them to, to engage in what, what is referred to as change talk. Now, we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about change talk today, but because that is, that is really sort of one of the, the, the uh, uh, basic found, it's a foundation of MI, but that's a little bit later on than what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk a little bit more about theory. 
the guiding style, and that's really how we would describe motivational interviewing, is sort of a combination of directing and following. But you know, in terms of directing, it's more like a little nudge here. It's a little bump here. It's focusing on somebody, something that somebody might have said that encourages them to talk more about why it's important for them to make specific changes, as opposed to why it's important for them to stay static in the current situation they are. So that's up to you guys as clinicians to sort of bump here and to choose and to be selective about what you attend to. So he goes on, they use their full five minutes and, and he provides her 10 words and he says, um, stop it or I'll bury you live in a box. <laughs> Um, so I think that could safely be considered maybe a directive style, and that is anything but what we would like to engage in. As, and as you saw, he, he completed that in, a, in approximately five minutes, and, and if we engaged in that style, as I mentioned, we would be pretty efficient. We could see a lot of folks in a day, um, but nobody's going to get well. And we, we use that sort of just in, in jest. But Sometimes when I've listened to tapes of counselors that, that, that we've had at, at our facilities, you know, sometimes it sounds like this. And maybe not exactly like that, but it's like, this is how you're going to do it. And if you don't do it this way, it's wrong. And so what we're talking about in terms of motivational interviewing is not utilizing the writing reflex, not trying to fix everything. That's not really our job. And so we're going to talk a little bit more about this. But MI is designed to strengthen personal motivation. That's what really we're looking at, is that internal, that intrinsic drive and commitment to a specific goal by eliciting and exploring the person's own reasons for change, their own reasons for change, not ours and not maybe the court system, but their own reasons for change within an atmosphere of accept, acceptance and compassion. So in terms of the motivation, what we know is that motivation can be influenced by a clinician's style. As you saw Bob Newhart right there, how motivated do you think that that, that, that lady would be walking out of the office to address any of the issues? Probably not so. Um, and, and, and so what we're looking to do is to change how we interact with a patient in such a way that it changes how they behave. Motivation can be modified. We know that. The more we push, okay, the more resistant the patient becomes. We're going to spend a fair amount of time talking about resistance. We can enhance motivation or we can shut it down in an instant, depending on how we are, depending on whether or not we utilize the skills that allows a person to achieve their full potential. So as we say here, the lack of motivation, it, it's not a challenge for the client. It's not a challenge for the patient. That's really a side effect of where they're at. That's part of their disorder. That's part of the disease. The lack of motivation really is the challenge for us. And being able to interact with an individual in such a way, and so many different individuals, in such a way that we can motivate them, create a discrepancy from where they are to where they think they want to be, and help to, help to sort of enhance that process. So the basic principles of motivational interviewing are, number one, express empathy. Okay? We want to be able to connect with the individual, develop discrepancy from where they are at this point in time to hopefully what some of those goals are of theirs. What, what is their value? What do they value in life? That helps us to connect with them. To roll with, with resistance, not to push back. The more we push back on resistance, the more 
resistant an individual becomes. And with that, if we continue to push, we're not going to get anywhere. And we want to support the individual's self-efficacy, help develop self-esteem, help them to become the individual that they would like to be based on the goals that they would like to achieve. So the spirit of MI, again, really is a partnership. What we're looking is to develop a partnership, coaching. We're a team. If something goes wrong in that process, it's not the individual's fault. It's, it's something that we have not recognized as a team that influenced in a negative way the individual's behavior and potentially contributed to a slip or a relapse. And if we approach it like a team, we're most likely to get a lot further with the individual than we would otherwise. Acceptance, acceptance of their condition. Sometimes it's hard to do. We don't have to agree with what the individual does, who they are. That's, that's not what this is about. This is about understanding where they are, what their condition is. We don't know how, how they got there. In time, we may know how they got there. But if we haven't been there, and, and in all instances, we haven't experienced exactly what that individual ha has experienced, okay? that acceptance that we can show them, that non-judgmental, unequivocal acceptance of where they are and where they would like to be is really going to help promote motivation and help promote that change that we're both looking for. Compassion. So what's the difference between compassion and, and, and sympathy? What is compassion to you? What do you when, when somebody's compassionate, sort of what is it that you see in them? They care. Okay? And how do they show that? How do they show that they care? Understanding. Understanding. They listen. Validation. Tell me a little bit more about the validation part. I don't even know that they understand their experience. Okay. All right. Yeah. Yeah. That's horrible. It, it's, nobody should have to go through that. Absolutely. Somebody else had their hand in the back. Yes, sir. The willingness to go into what's uncomfortable to do the right thing. The willingness to go into what's uncomfortable to do the right thing. Yeah. And, and lots of times... For our individuals, being sober, not using, is pretty uncomfortable, isn't it? You know, I mean, you know, that, that, is, that is quite a challenge, you know, for our, our, the patients that we see. And being uncomfortable in that situation. Evocation. So, in order to get anywhere, we have to be able to get our patients, get our clients, to share their experience with us. If we're talking all the time, that's not going to happen. If we're telling them what to do, that really isn't going to happen. We have to partner with them, let them know that we care and that we understand, and that we're here to help them in whatever way that we can. And if we can do that, we can get them to share in this process and engage in this process and ultimately be successful. So the spirit, in terms of the style, we're not judgmental. We're collaborative. We really do work as a team. It is a partnership. We can be gently persuasive. Like I said, a little bump. Somebody might say, ah, it's, it's manipulative, the, what, what you do. No, it, it's not really. We're just, we're just giving a little nudge here, a little nudge there, paying specific attention to the things that we believe are going to help to engage the person in, 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 in pro-social type behaviors, to get them to stop using, to get them to engage in either educational or vocational pursuits, to help them get back together with their family. It's persuasive, yeah. It's supportive. How many of you have argued with a patient about a specific sort of intervention or objective that they wanted to achieve? How far did you get with them when you were arguing? You know, even if you were arguing about a UA result, 
and you know that the test was positive. The test came back positive. Okay. The last 10 tests were positive. There's no reason why the 11th one here shouldn't be positive as well. But they insist that that was negative. Now, we could argue that point with them. We could spend the next 50 minutes arguing that point with them. Are we going to get anywhere with it? Probably not. But if we were to engage them in a different discussion, talking to them about what ha might have happened over the course of the weekend, and who they were around, and what sort of activities, they, ultimately it's probably going to come forward as to what happened, who they were around, which party they went to, those sorts of things. So we don't, we don't have to fight with them. We don't have to argue a point with them. There's no real need for us to be right because it really doesn't, it doesn't resolve anything. And we listen. Ultimately, that's really our goal, is, is to listen to what's going on and ask some questions about what's going on with the individual in such a way that it allows them to open up, to have a conversation, without our thinking about what the next question is going to be. And again, communicating respect. And we know that if, if we can gain, if, if, if our patients, if our clients can understand that we respect where they at, their condition, and we don't judge them based upon what their behaviors are, we're likely to get much further along. We explore the client's perceptions without labeling or correcting them. There's no need for us to label or correct. We don't even have to diagnose. We don't even need have to diagnose. How many times have we engaged in an individual where we need to get them to admit that they're an alcoholic or that they're a you know, that they have some sort of substance use disorder or that they're an addict. Do we actually need them to say that in order to progress, in order to help them do well? I think not. So we do, you know, in, in, in MI, unlike CBT, CBT we do some teaching, we do modeling, you know, there's psychoeducational groups. Um, we do some skill training as well. Interestingly enough, we don't really do that in MI, but MI can be combined with a number of different approaches. MI and CBT is a great, is a, is a you know, they go hand in hand. It's a great tool um, when, you, when you combine them. Resistance is seen as an interpersonal behavior pattern influenced by none other than us, the clinician. So if we can change how we react to resistance, Okay. We can ultimately sort of be successful with our, with our clients. And resistance is met with reflection. Okay. And we're going to talk about the, the core concepts and the micro skills today of motivational interviewing. The client, ultimately, it's their, it's their battle to fight. It's not our battle. The responsibility is left with them. That's part of why this is such, there's such a protective factor for the counselors when they use MI is because it really puts the onus for change upon them, on, on, the, on the client and not necessarily on, on the clinician. You know how sometimes we get so frustrated when our clients don't do exactly what we tell them or exactly what we think that we, we should do. Well, or that they should do, excuse me. The reality is, is it's their choice. So change arises from within, though I'll tell you what, there's sometimes that, that you know, when, when there's extrinsic motivation, when the courts are saying you need to do this, it can be incredibly effective, you know, for impaired physicians and, and impaired professionals. Having that license be held over your head and having routine or regular uh, supervision and drug testing can be very powerful. The emphasis is really on the client's personal choice. That's what we're looking at. It's their choice. They can make those decisions or not, but they ultimately have to live with those results. And what our goal is, is to get them to elicit, to get them to evoke the reasons for making those decisions and to keep them sort of away or keep the sort of the other reasons 
for continuing their, their, their use or maintaining the status quo, sort of keep those at bay and not engage in conversations around those. So the clinician has a strong sense of purpose. Um, we want to amplify the discrepancy from what's going on with the individual and we help to enhance their motivation. And how we enhance their motivation is by engaging them in the conversation and guiding, steering that conversation in such a way that they give us all the reasons why it's important for them to make the changes. We can list all those reasons. That's, that, that's easy enough for us to do. But if we list that, how likely are they to make those changes? If they list those changes, if they give us all the reasons why it's important to make the changes, why it's important for them to stop using, they're more likely to pay attention to that. So in terms of the four processes, engaging happens all the time. From the moment that the individual walks in to, you know, from the, from the moment they pick up the phone to make contact, to, to set up an assessment, until the time they, they, they leave the program and hopefully go on to a different level of care, we are engaging them, constantly engaging them. And we try to focus. Next is focusing. Try to get them to focus on the aspects of change that are most important to them, on those behaviors. Now all along, we, we engage them in that process. We get them to talk about what is important to them, what is of value to them, why these changes in their eyes are necessary. And then lastly, we do some planning. And usually, if we start planning before we've actually helped somebody, you know, focus, you know, and, and really get them engaged in that process, we're all likelihood going to lose them. So planning is one of the last things that we really do. We want to get them to engage in the process, to share in the discovery. Remember, they are the experts. When it comes to their condition, nobody knows their condition better than they do. So again, it's, it's kind of like a highway. You know, we have, there's, there's the engaging process, focusing, narrowing things down by the questions that we ask, getting them to talk about their condition, what's, not so, what's so bad about their condition, what they would like to change about those condition, that condition. And then, and, then, and then planning the process. What is it that you would like to do with this? How would it look to not use anymore? Asking some open-ended questions to allow them to explore the reasons that they might want to make those changes. How that might look like. Making those changes might sort of appear in their life. But ad additionally, to draw upon maybe any successes that they've had in the past in relation to their recovery and the recovery process. Okay, so where do we start? Obviously, it depends on where the patient is. Okay, and, and that's important for us to identify. Sort of where are they in terms of the stages of change? You know, if, if their pre-contemplation or contemplation, really what we need to do is explore their desire to make changes, their ability. You know, somebody may have the desire, but they may not have the ability. They may be sort of, hey, I've never done this before. Or when I've done this before, I have not been successful. So we might be able to talk to them about those aspects of the recovery where maybe they have been successful. The reasons why they should engage in this. This is a difficult process. As you mentioned, it may be the, the most difficult thing that, that, that people have done in their entire life. And usually when we take on something like that that's difficult, we expect huge changes in our life right away. And sometimes that doesn't occur. Sometimes that wreckage that we've developed over the past, whether it's financial or relationship-wise, just doesn't all disappear. It, it isn't remedied by our one week, two weeks, two months, one year of sobriety, of recovery. Sometimes we have to deal with that stuff for a while and it can be frustrating. So in terms of 
the preparation, a lot of our effort in getting an individual sort of up this mountain of change and this motivation of change really is, is all about preparation and identifying change talk, identifying when an individual sort of recognizes that they do need to make a change and why they need to make that change and sort of helping them to enhance that. And then once, once we can get, get them to that point, we want to get them to, looks like kamite me ent, something like that, okay? Um, I'm sure that's not how it was spelled, but, but anyway, we want to get them to commit to making some of those changes, regardless of, of how large those changes are, and to engage them in that process and ultimately to take action, to take steps in, in, in making the change. So I want you to think about something. Okay, think about a personal change okay, that was difficult for you to make. You don't necessarily have to share that. How much time did it take for you to go from maybe thinking about it to actually taking some action? What was that like for you? Did somebody help that process along? So how long did it take? Just, just, you don't have to share what the change was, but how long did it take for you to make that change? Two years, one year, three years, 20 years, long time, absolutely. It can, it can take a long time. And we go back and forth, we think about that and then sometimes we shelve it and we go back to that behavior. And sometimes we're better at it and sometimes we're not. One of the things I'd like you to think about is, think about a mentor that you had. Think about somebody in your life who you looked up to, okay? Might have been a coach, a teacher, a professor, you know, a relative. Somebody that sort of paid attention to you. Somebody that you admired. What were some of the aspects of that individual that drew you to them, that helped to motivate you? What was it about that person that you admired? Unconditional, Unconditional regard. What did that feel like? Really Felt really good. So even if you made a mistake, it was like, hey, I'm, I'm here to support you. It, did, it didn't matter. But that's pretty unusual, isn't it? Okay, thank you. Yeah. Unconditional positive, okay. So again, so again, it's, it's that acceptance of the individual, where they are and who they are. Yes, sir? Having an accessibility. Oh, being there. They're there. They're, they're, yeah, yeah, they call, they're there. So, and, 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 and you can count on them being there repeatedly, over and over. Somebody else had the hand up. What else? Open-minded. Okay, being a good listener. Okay. Have faith and trust in you that, that you can figure this out without telling you what to do, it sounds like. Okay. Sometimes they would, though, huh? Yeah, I kind of had a question about that when you mentioned earlier, because you said they are the best person to know what their situation is, which is very different from the belief that addiction has inherent denial, self-deception, self-delusion. Um, I, don't, I don't know. I don't always think that they know. Yeah. A lot of times I think they don't know. Mm -hmm. They're totally full of it. And they need our whatever, and, which of course you have to be, find the right way to... Yeah, and I think the MI is our whatever. Okay, I, I really, I, I believe that. I believe the MI is, is, is our whatever. And yeah, you know, they're, they're terrible historians, okay? You know, they, they don't recall what happened over the course of the weekend and whether they did this or whether they did that. And, and yeah, you know, there's a lot of shame around what we've done, what we do. There's a lot of guilt. Sometimes we don't want to share that. We don't want to just put it out there. But I think ultimately, when it comes down to making a decision about their own condition, 
I think they know best. And our job really is to help draw that out. Yes, sir. Yeah, which is which is critically important. Thank you. Appreciate that. Yes. Yeah, I think over the course of the years, I've never met one person that didn't want something to change from the very first moment they entered treatment from the very first time. Yeah. Now that change that they may be wanting is many times different than what I'm wanting them to change. Yeah. And that's where the struggle comes in because of the war of the wills, you might say, as I'm not listening to them and I'm trying to impose my will on them of what I want them to change and how I want them to do it. Sure. So I think if we, as clinicians, back away from that and truly start to listen and give them the space, they will tell us quite a bit about it. Yeah, and, and I, I appreciate you saying that because it's really our sort of backing away and not pushing. Because clearly the more, the more we push, the more entrenched they, they, they become. And so I think if we back off and let them sort of make up the ground, I think we're, I think we're, 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 we're better off. And ultimately, more importantly, I think they're better off. Yes, Hugh. Yeah, I'm trying to give them empowerment for them to make the change themselves. Yeah. Let them see, I back away, try to build a rapport. If I have the time to build a rapport. Okay. Let them see what's And most of the clients I deal with, they're not good at that. Yeah. They're not good at that. So I have to yeah, I, I, I'll tell you what. I mean, w when we talked about this room, you know, we talked about making a change, our making, uh, you know, our own change, regardless of what that was. It 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 takes years, and sometimes it, you know, it, it we're immobilized by that fear. Yes, ma'am. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, ultimately, get the, their buy-in with that. So what's, Im what's important, too, is to find out what's of value to them in, in their life. If we can identify, if they can identify something that is of value to them, something really worth, worth living for, so to speak, um, you know, ultimately, they can attach to that. And, and they, can, they can sort of, you know, figure out what it is and why it is they can make those changes. So we know that, we know that external motivation, ex, you know, extrinsic motivation can help a little bit. But ultimately, to, to be able to sustain it, somebody has to have sort of an internal guiding sort of motivation, intrinsic motivation, to be able to make and sustain those changes. Now, clearly, yes, sir. And it seems like more and more also companies, one of their motivations is keeping my job. And but changing that from an external reason that, you know, my mom, they're going to fire me if I show up drunk and I'm one. Yeah. And, but to change, to get that to change from, to be more, I'm, I'm on my internal part. It's part of yeah, but you see, the, the, the beauty of, of having the job work with you is there's a little additional pressure that we don't have to apply. Ultimately, the choice is, there, is theirs. I, they can keep using and keep drinking and lose their job, but that's something of value to them that ultimately maybe might, might turn it around. Okay, and, and that's, that's what we hope for because there are some protective factors in terms of oversight, you know, from either, you know, an educational system or, or an employer or family members. There are, some, that outside motivation can help a great deal. So I'm not going to spend time on, you know, uh, stages of change, but ultimately, really, you have to figure out where somebody is. And, and more often than not, I mean, lots of times we get individuals in, in pre-contemplation, 
But if we can engage them in a discussion, in a meaningful discussion about their condition, create a discrepancy from where they're at and where they would ultimately like to be, and get them to talk about how that might look, what that might look like, and how they may go about doing that. It's not a perfect solution. That's not what we're talking about here. But the more that we can get them to engage in that conversation, ultimately, the more successful they can become. So we know ambivalence is, is a natural part of the process, um, regardless of, of how, that, how that might appear. Um, and, and it fluctuates. Sometimes we want to engage in, yeah, she, she can get annoying pretty quick, can't she? There, <laughs> let's do that. Um, I, I, I often forget that she's doing her face thing there. But um, anyway, so, um, and it fluctuates. Motivation, it, it's, it's not a constant thing. You know, sometimes, sometimes, you know, I feel really good about being able to manage my hypertension. Okay? I exercise, I don't eat salt, but uh, there is an occasion, I don't know, do you guys like Tommy's burgers? Yeah. Oh my God, okay. All right, and I get it with extra chili, and I do like salt on my fries. I mean, it just kills me. Every once in a while, I blow it. But you know, when I go in and, and I talk to my doctor about that, he doesn't chastise me for having an occasional Tommy's burgers. He doesn't kick me out of the office for having an occasional Tommy's burger either, you know? But he understands. He goes, yeah, you know what, Al? I know what you're talking about. He says, I like chocolate lava cake with ice cream on it. And then we just sort of commiserate and drool over each other. But anyway, that's... So sometimes we want to change, sometimes we don't. Sometimes getting to the gym is really easy, you know? And sometimes I need, some, I need help. I need somebody to motivate me to get to the gym. And sometimes, you know, when I, when I get to the gym and I don't want to be there, and when I leave, it's like, wow, I did something really successful today. I didn't want to do that. It wasn't a great workout, but yet I was there. That's one of those victories. And I think if we can affirm that within our patients, affirm that with ourselves as well, that, hey, you know what, yeah, it wasn't the best workout, but you did it anyway. You didn't want to be there, but you, you, you showed up. And that's important. And cut ourselves some slack when it comes to that. So working with ambivalence is really at the core here. And that's really what MI is, is all about. And as Pascal says, people are better persuaded by the reasons they themselves discovered than those that come into the minds of others. So if I can talk to you about my hypertension and why it's really important for me to engage in, 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 in exercise and to eat well, you know, and to take medication if that's something that's necessary, if I can convince myself to do that, it's a lot easier on you to tr than, than to try to convince me to do that. My doctor has, doesn't have to do that. He doesn't have to tell me. I know all the reasons why I shouldn't be doing X, Y, or Z, and I should be doing A, B, and C. I know those reasons. So do our patients, our clients. They know those reasons why. They, you know, they're, they're usually not happy. They're usually unhappy with the condition that they're in right now.